Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. The book of Proverbs and chapter number 18. We've been walking through the book of Proverbs just bit by bit, here a little, there a little, trying to gain and glean a lot of these principles that we find in Proverbs as we are searching for wisdom. We now find our way to Proverbs chapter number 18 and a very important text. So if you don't mind to look with me in the book of Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs 18, and notice with me first of all, in verse number 20, Proverbs 18, starting at verse number 20, the Bible says this, a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth and with the increase of his lips shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit of thereof. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, mark a phrase that we find in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. With this, we're going to hit a very important message dealing with this subject, the death and life are in the power of the the tongue. Let's go to the Lord together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come to you, we're just asking that you would give us grace and that you would give us mercy, that you would help us to have understanding, that you would just let this be clear, that you would let us just please apply this to our own hearts, that we could go ahead and just see the importance of our lips and our tongue and our words and how they could truly be used to build up and how often they are used to tear down. Grant us wisdom, understanding, knowledge, discernment. Lord, your Holy Spirit has to give all of that. I'm just a poor vessel. The best I know how I just surrender myself to you knowing my inadequacies and my inabilities. And that you could open up your word in a special way tonight to draw us close, to let us realize the power that we have in our tongues and that we would realize that we need to use them wisely. You get your work done. And by the time we're done, that not only would we be convicted, but we would be willing to make decisions to honestly change our mouths. We love you in Jesus name. Amen. Now, A lot of times in the book of Proverbs, these verses are standalone. That meaning for the most part, these are just a collection of different sayings, which is one of the reasons why through this series, we're just usually taking a verse and then explaining the principle and see what happens. This here, even though verse number 21 is usually used as a standalone, verse number 20 is the context of what is given here. Notice with me Proverbs 18 and verse number 20. The very first thing I want to show you is that whatever the fruit, we must live with the consequences of the tongue. Whatever the fruit, we must live with the consequences of the tongue. Interesting enough, the subject that is most brought up in the book of Proverbs is the subject of our tongue. More than any other topic, the tongue is the emphasis. I'm not going to turn to them all. We're going to take some time to look at things a little bit later. But in the book of Proverbs, you have Proverbs 6.17, Proverbs 6.24, Proverbs 11.20, Proverbs 10.31, Proverbs 11, or 12.18, Proverbs 12.19, Proverbs 15.2, Proverbs 15.4, Proverbs 16.1, Proverbs 17.4, Proverbs 17.20, Proverbs 18.21, 
Proverbs 21, 6, Proverbs 21, 23, Proverbs 25, 15, Proverbs 25, 23, Proverbs 16, 18, Proverbs 18, 23, in addition, Proverbs 31, 36. And there's even more than that, but those are ones that just highlight the tongue. That is a lot of subject matter to be covered with the idea of the tongue. The tongue is one of the things that gets us in trouble the most. The tongue is one of the things that ruins our day. The tongue is the one thing that ruins relationship. Our tongue is one of the paramount things that we do on a daily basis. And a lot of time it has no filter, no bridle. And it just swaths a path of destruction. In order to really understand the context here, Notice with me verse 21. It almost sounds like they are two unrelated subjects, but the end of 21 brings them together. But it starts off by giving a kind of principle. Notice with me verse 20. A man's belly, we all know what our belly is. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of the mouth. Now that's a very interesting thing here. In the Bible, the word belly is often a figure of speech for man himself. It's what we experience. It's what we try to fill. A lot of people are run by their belly. They're directed by their belly. Uh, when I was younger, especially, I, my belly would tell me to wake up at one o'clock in the morning and walk to the refrigerator and go help myself. And I had to go feed the belly. Some of you might understand that. Your belly controls a lot that you do, especially in our society today where we have so many choices of takeout that we get to the place where we're trying to figure out what's going to satisfy my belly. What sounds good today? What should we have? We have more choices than ever before and we're more unsatisfied than ever before. But the idea of the belly is an idea of us, ourselves. It's something we could relate to because our belly controls a lot of our life. Maybe we could say this just off the cuff. Outside of the tongue, our belly controls everything else that we do. Our tongue runs a lot of things. Our belly runs a lot more things. Verse 20 carries the idea here that a man's belly should be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. So... When you eat something, your belly has to be satisfied with what's put in. Your lips and your belly usually cannot, um, your belly doesn't have a say in the matter. Every once in a while, your belly can say, ah, forget this and kick it back up. For the most part, your belly has to be satisfied with whatever you put into it. And with that, any consequences that go along with it. A man's belly should be satisfied with the fruit of the mouth and the increase of his lips he shall be filled. That you put things in your mouth, your belly and your whole body has to be satisfied with what you put in. So if you put in tons of junk food, your body has to not only be satisfied with it, but deal with the consequences of it. Some of you might suffer through lots of heartburn, but you love spicy chili. And so you know that you're going to have to deal with the consequences. In order to get what you enjoy, you're going to have to deal with those consequences later on. It's just part of it. You have to say, body, you have to live with it. You're going to have to eat it. So this is what it's doing here, is getting an uh, understanding that our belly, ourselves, have to deal with whatever consequences we put into our mouth. You put something icky in your mouth, that's something you have to do. If you decide you're going to get McDonald's and you're going to get a quarter pounder with cheese with extra grease just so it slides right into it, your body is going to have to deal with the consequences of that decision you made. All right? We're, we're getting the point of it, right? Um, <coughs> Zeb likes it to experience the different quick trip milks, whether it's pumpkin spice milk or root beer milk. Or, that's what they have in Wisconsin. All right? So they have root beer milk mint milk, whatever milk, uh, all the different milks, he has to deal with the consequences of it. <coughs> My daughter doesn't, dairy doesn't agree with her, but she loves ice cream. She goes, in order to get what I want, I'm going to have to deal with the consequences. All right, we, we've kind of beat this illustration to death, but we can understand what we're talking about now. That what you put in your mouth, your body has to deal with. It has to deal with the consequences of whatever you put in your mouth. The same is true in the reverse. You have to be willing to live with the consequences of whatever comes out of your mouth. 
not only the intake, but you also have to live with the consequences of the outtake because you cannot take those words back. Once those words are released, they are now in the wild and they will always have consequences. Some good consequences, some bad consequences, some inattended consequences. You ever t- say something and then say, I didn't mean it? I didn't quite mean that. You're trying to backtrack. The ha- reason why you said that is because it had unintentional consequences. And you're trying to do your best to get it back in, but it cannot happen. Just like when you put something in your mouth, as verse 20 is saying, verse number 21 now says you have to deal with the consequences of what comes out. Notice at the end of verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Once again, it is saying you have to live with the consequences of whatever comes in your mouth and you have to live with the consequences of whatever comes out of your mouth. This is a big deal. This is why we need to pay attention, not only to what goes into our mouth, which again, we live in a society today where that's always talked about. And if it's not talked about, your doctor talks about it. And if your doctor doesn't talk about it, some person on the street, some magazine, it's going to be talked about what gets put into your body, what gets put into your mouth. You have to deal with the consequences. Just like that emphasis, the emphasis needs to be made over and over. There are consequences for what comes out of our mouth and we have to deal with it. So with that in mind, let's now study, first of all, the power of life in the tongue. The power of life in the tongue. What happens when we have a righteous and gentle tongue? With this, we're going to do a quick survey of many different passages within Proverbs. What does the book of Proverbs have to say concerning our tongue, specifically dealing with the power of life in our tongue? Notice, if you don't mind, Proverbs 10. Let's start there. Proverbs 10. That's why I didn't take my time with the list before, because we're going to hit them now. Proverbs 10. What does the Bible, what does Proverbs have to say specifically with dealing with our tongue? Notice with me, if you don't mind, Proverbs 10, verse 31, Proverbs 10 and verse 31, the mouth of the just bringeth forth wisdom, but the forward tongue shall be cut out. Notice the emphasis at the beginning of this verse, the mouth of the just or the righteous, those who are right, bringeth forth wisdom. Do you know one of the things that can come out of our mouth that can help people is wisdom. Now this wisdom comes from us looking at God, us being right, us having a right position. But as we're right with God and we're being a help, wisdom should what comes out of us. Now, of course, we know that in the Bible, especially Proverbs, that wisdom is pictured by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is wisdom. And if you have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you and you've uh, succeeded control to the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit should be using you as a vessel to give wisdom to others. Isn't that amazing how that works? Wisdom comes out if we're right with God and we need wisdom. Remember, how does God speak to us? God speaks to us in three ways. He speaks primarily through his word. That's first and foremost, and by the way, that is paramount. Nothing else on this list can counteract God's word. If anything opposes God's word, then that's not God speaking. First of all, God's word. Second of all, God uses other Christians. Other Christians. How does he use other Christians? By using wisdom. It could be that as the pastor's preaching, that he says something that you needed to hear. Praise the Lord, you needed that wisdom. It could be that you're in a conversation and looking for advice from biblical leadership, biblical counselors, and you're looking for something, answers, and they give you some wisdom. They direct you through that. The third and the least reliable is circumstances. But notice the first two deal with words. God's word 
and then the words of other Christians. God uses other Christians to help guide us, direct us. Remember that God leads us through biblical authority, that God directs us using wisdom of those who are right with him. So how can our tongues be used for life? By providing wisdom as God is using us as we're right with him. Notice something else, Proverbs chapter 12. We see something else interesting. Proverbs chapter 12. Notice with me, Proverbs chapter 12, and notice with me in verse 18. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 18. There is that speaketh like piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. Notice the end of this. The tongue of the wise is health. Do you know that there are sometimes our words can be used to help someone to become healthy? Not just physically, but spiritually. Healthy in body, healthy in mind, healthy in spirit. That there is power in the tongue. Remember that there's Life and death of the power of the tongue. Part of this life provides the health, the words that people need. The Bible talks quite a bit about this, especially in the book of Proverbs. But your words can be exactly what someone needs to live. Your words could be exactly what someone needs to become spiritually healthy, mentally healthy. Your words can have life. We talked about listening last week. That sometimes our words and our listening could be the one thing that makes them make a decision not to kill themselves. That encouragement right at the last moment could be the last encouragement they needed to make the right decision. Our words have power of healing in it. Notice if you don't mind, Proverbs chapter 15. We see another principle here, Proverbs 15. And notice with me in verse 2. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Notice this, the tongue of the wise useth knowledge. The wise tongue is going to give knowledge, specifically about the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and following after him. But a knowledgeable tongue, people are looking for knowledge. They're looking for answers. And the tongue of the wise can be used to give them answers that they need. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. Using knowledge properly. Notice if you don't mind Proverbs 15 and verse 4. Proverbs 15 and verse 4. The wholesome tongue is a tree of life. But the perverseness thereof is a breach in the spirit. A wholesome tongue carries the idea that it is complete, it is whole. The idea of perverseness carries the idea to go on a wrong path. So the person that's on the right path, a wholesome tongue, is a tree of life. But perverseness there is a breach in the spirit. Now we know we live in a perverse um, society. But when we're trying to live right... And then there's perversion that comes in, a twisting of a mind. What happens is it hurts our spirit. It hurts us when we hear or see something that we know that is a violation, that is a twistedness. At least it should for any Christian that's following after God. It should cause us to blush, by the way. The Bible says that one of the... the, the Things that God had an accusation against Israel for is that they lost their blush. Were they shamed when they committed abomination? Nay, they were not ashamed. Neither could they blush. Jeremiah chapter 6 and Jeremiah chapter 7 repeat that. Neither could they blush. Well, there should be some things that should make a Christian to blush. But a wholesome 
tongue is a tree of life. That when our tongue is not perverted and our minds are not perverted and our spirit's not perverted, the things that we should say should be an encouragement to people and help them enjoy the life that they have. Do you know there is a difference when Christians get together and play games and have a good time? There should be something there that is not perverted, that we're not worrying about, oh, oh what are we going to hear? What are we going to say? It should be a safe environment. There should be life there. There should be an enjoyment there. What else do we see? Notice with me Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16 and verse 1. Proverbs 16 and verse 1. The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. What else? The word of God. The word of the Lord. That if God has prepared our heart, the answers that come out should be what God has said. God's word. What are we preparing in our heart, by the way? You've been putting the Bible into it. It should be the thing that's coming out when we're right with God. You know what people need? They don't need to hear from me. And they don't need to hear from you. They need to hear from the Lord. They need to hear God's word. They need those answers So we know that there is power in the life of the tongue. And that when we're right with God and that we're seeking after God and surrender to God, the words that come out of our mouth should provide wisdom, healing, knowledge, life, and it should be the word of God because that's what people need. The book of Proverbs also shows the reverse, that there's the power of death in our tongue. The power of death in our tongue. Notice if you don't mind as we look at what the book of Proverbs has to say about a perverse and unguarded tongue. That perverse means it's twisted. The idea of unguarded means there's no filter. We just let it fly. I think I should be able to speak my mind. That's very, very dangerous. Because first of all, nobody wants to hear what you said. Second of all, we want to hear from the Lord, not you. Notice Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 7. What happens when we have a perverse and unguarded tongue? What kind of death is found in that tongue? Notice Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 17. Proverbs 6 and verse 17. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Notice that these are part of the six things that God hates. But notice it goes on, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed blood. That word and is very key there. It's giving this list together. Do you know that with our tongue, we can shed innocent blood? You say, how does this work out? The book of Leviticus actually puts this way, that the idea of gossip is equivalent to murder. It's character assassination. Do you know how you kill people? Gossip. You know how you hurt people tremendously? Gossip. I was dealing with a situation not too long ago where there was a mistake made by someone in leadership and the gossip tore upon that workplace just blazed. And now... He's got to try to repair something that should have been an easy fix, but the gossip has stirred so many things up that it's going to make it very difficult for an easy fix to be applied because the gossip has churned. It has assassinated the character of that person without him having a hearing, without him having an offense. He's already been judged guilty before anyone ever heard what was going on. That's what how dangerous our tongue can be is that we could put someone on trial, sentence them, condemn them and sentence them without having a fair hearing. That's how dangerous our tongue is, is that it can shed innocent blood. It can hurt people deeply where they don't recover. Gossip is such a dangerous, dangerous thing. What else do we see? Notice with me the book of Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs 15 and verse number 4. 
We just saw the first part of this verse. Let's now pay attention to the second part of the verse. Proverbs 15 and verse 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but the perverseness there is, is the breach of a spirit. That word of a breach carries with it breaking a spirit. Do you know that with our words, we can break someone's spirit? We could break someone down with our words. It is amazing how many today, the childhood trauma that has now come to fruition to adults now because their parents tore them down all the time with their lips. It's to the place where we deal with anybody. We all have to make them stand in a mirror and look at themselves and say, I like you. Because they've been told they've been worthless their whole life. And we have to reverse that effects. You're not going to amount to anything. You are worthless. You're never going to see anything. You're never going to marry well. It's amazing to see what happened. There's a person of history who wrote hymns in his hymn, in their hymn book. But his brother, as a... Um, <laughs> The man, and I'll just do it, Charles Wesley. He was engaged to a beautiful girl who was smart and whatever else. His brother, John Wesley, said, ah, she's too good for you. You need to marry this girl. She's more your speed. And she was someone that made him miserable all of his life. Just because he said, ah, you're not worth that. You can't get that. You might as well stay down here. Those type of things can hurt and break someone's spirit. If you're told that you're worthless all of your life, you're going to start to believe it. Forgive me for quoting Adolf Hitler, but Adolf Hitler said, if you tell the lie long enough, loud enough, and often enough, the people will believe it. That is very true. If you're told all of your life you're not going to amount to something, you're going to start to believe it. If you're going to be told that you're never going to, uh, to uh, be able to succeed, you're going to believe it. If you are told that you're worthless, you're going to start to believe it. That's the power of a tongue. And by the way, some of these people are not like parents don't mean to do that. They just forget that they're supposed to use their tongue to lift someone up and they're just hurting. And so they hurt other people. And sometimes it's the kids that suffer through it. And now we have to pick up the breaches and try to repair it. They can't move forward. We're just trying to get them up to where they're functional. Our tongue can break someone's spirit. How about this? Proverbs 17, verse 4. Proverbs 17 and verse 4. Proverbs 17, verse 4. A wicked doer giveth heed to false lips, and a liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. What it's saying here is that the false lips and the naughty tongue, they can encourage evil. A wicked doer giveth heed or pays attention to false lips. Hey man, you go ahead and do that. You're not going to get in trouble. Okay. It's amazing that there's a lot of people who do wrong be after they've asked permission from someone who gave them permission to do wrong. Hey man, do you think I could steal that car? Oh sure, go ahead. Okay. Our lips can actually encourage someone to do wrong, to do evil. A liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. We need to be careful because our lips can actually encourage someone to do wrong, to steal, to, uh, to things. Um, we had a long time ago in a different church, we had a lady who got sideways with one of my messages. That happens. But she went and immediately in between services called every lady in the church and convinced them that they all needed never to come back to the church. So that Sunday night, we're missing people. But that original lady came back and she goes, well, I believe that God wanted me to be here. But what about the rest of the people you told not to come? Is that awful? She encouraged people to sin, to do what they weren't supposed to do, do evil by her lips to encourage them. Notice it goes on, Proverbs 17, verse 20. Proverbs 17, verse 20. 
He that hath a forward heart findeth no good, and he that hath a perverse tongue falleth into mischief. The one who has a perverse, twisted tongue actually bl- brings on disaster. They invite mischief to fall upon them. Isn't it amazing? The more we talk, the more trouble seems to find us. That's what the verse is saying here. That we talk and we talk and we're talking foolishly and disasters come in our life. Not just because of things that we said, but it seems like those people who talk too much seem to have more bad things happen to them. Isn't that an interesting insight? That the more that you talk, the more you invite trouble in your life. It's almost enough that maybe we should stop talking. (laughs) Talk very little not to invite trouble to come to our life. Notice as it goes on and with some more. Verse number 21, uh, chapter 21, Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21. And notice with me verse 23. Proverbs 21 and verse 23. It says, Whosoever keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. So here it's telling if you learn to keep your mouth and your tongue, you keep your soul from trouble. Once again, our tongue causes lots of trouble for us. Trouble with relationships, trouble with friendships at work, trouble at work, trouble with our boss, trouble with our spouse, trouble with our kids, trouble with our parents. Our mouth can often write checks that we cannot cash. Our tongue can get us into lots and lots of trouble. We need to be very, very careful with that. It can cause lots of heartache and lots of trouble. Notice with me as we go on, Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. And notice with me, verse 23. Proverbs 25 and verse 23. Ah, Proverbs 25, 23. I was correct. Proverbs 25, verse 23. The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. The angry countenance is someone who's angry in their spirit and it's going to open the door to a backbiting or gossiping tongue. You know, there's lots of things that we say in anger and with our anger, we try to hurt people with our words. We snap at people around us. Even if they were not related, we're just trying to hurt someone because we're angry. And we're looking for convenient targets. This goes back to children. So many times parents are angry with someone else that they end up hurting their children because they're convenient targets. This idea of anger comes to fruition and brings up to this idea. And again, chapter number 25 and verse 23, a north wind driveth away rain. So doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. These things work together and they follow each other. So the north wind in Israel, remember it's a desert society, so winds were very important to them. When that north wind would come, it would bring the rain out of the system. They just knew if there was a north wind, the rain's going to stop. We're not going to have any rain. You could almost write it down that if someone has an angry countenance, they're going to try to hurt someone with their words. So you stay away from them. Beware of them. Notice as it goes on. That's why you need to take care of anger, by the way. Angry people really hurt the people around them quite often. Notice with me as we go on still in chapter 25. Notice with me in verse 15. Proverbs 25 and verse 15. By long forbearing is a prince persuaded. Now, (laughs) that's just talking about you don't say, hey, 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 you ready? Can you listen to me now? Hey, hey, you listen to me now? Can we do it now? Is it time now? Is it time now? It's talking about patience. You give the news and wait and let them make the proper decision. It's won by patience. But notice this. By long forbearing is a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. 
We have an old saying, an old nursery rhyme that sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That's the biggest lie because words do hurt. Words stick with you a long time and they can break your bones. They can break your spirit. There's this idea that it causes lots of damage. Notice if you don't mind in verse 26, chapter 26, rather, chapter 26 and verse 28. Chapter 26 and verse 28. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. Now, that first one we understand, a lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it. When you lie against people, you're hurting people. That goes without saying. The last part is where we're putting our attention on here. And a flattering mouth worketh ruin. What is flattery? It's trying to falsely build someone up, trying to butter them up, trying to bring them to a position that they're not at, trying to make them think more highly, whether you want to use the idea of brown nosing, flattering. The idea of a flattering mouth, it's going to end up hurting. The Bible speaks about ladies who have a flattering a flattering tongue. Stay away from them. They're going to bring ruin. You have someone at work that is always trying to flatter the boss and trying to suck up to them. They're going to cause ruin. The Bible just tells us that we could watch out. Their flattering mouth is going to work ruin. If you don't mind, one more verse. Notice as we go back, Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21 and verse 6. Proverbs 21 verse 6. The getting of treasures by a lying tongue is vanity. Toss to and fro of them that seek death. Notice this. They seek death. That when you try to get ahead by using your tongue, what's going to happen is that you are seeking after death. There's going to be a lot of destruction along the way. If you're willing to lie, cheat, steal, manipulate to get your way, there's going to be a carnage around you. There's going to be many people who get hurt because they're in your way to lie to them, to cheat to them. You know, it is amazing to see what our tongues will do and how they can hurt them around. We could give illustration after illustration and... uh, but we can get the idea here how dangerous our tongues really are. We don't have to give too many illustrations because we all have our own illustrations of people that we hurt, carnage that we have along the way. There's nothing like looking at someone that you love, but because you're angry, you say something and to watch their face change because you hurt them, because you snapped at them. The damage that you did, that trust that was broken, There's life and death, and they're in the power of the tongue. Remember that that whole passage there was talking about that we're going to have to live with the fruit of it. Just like we live with the fruit of what we put in our mouth, we're going to have to live with the fruit that comes out of our mouth. What do we do about this? Well, if you don't mind, turn with me to the book of James. Remember that the book of James is the book of wisdom for the New Testament. Just like Proverbs is the book of wisdom found in the Old Testament. The book of Proverbs says quite a bit about the tongue. But let's just focus on one specific passage, if you don't mind. The book of James. The book of James chapter number 3. The book of James chapter number 3. And notice, if you don't mind, in James chapter 3. <laughs> and notice with me starting at verse number 2. Verse, James chapter 3 and verse number 2. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and one that is able to bridle the whole tongue. So here it's saying, if you're able to live your life and not offend anyone with your word, with your tongues, with the things that you say, then you're a perfect man, complete, whole, wonderful. You're someone who's learned how to tame, bridle your tongue. 
This is the goal. To be someone that has controlled your tongue that you don't hurt people around you. Why? Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. Notice as it goes on verse 3. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouth and they may, that they may obey us, that we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be great, are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. So here it gives two creatures too huge bigger than us you take a horse and you could guide it by using a bridle to the left or to the right this big horse that if you're to be honest if it didn't want to go anywhere it wasn't going to go anywhere and yet it could be guided with just some bit in their mouth you take a huge ship and that huge ship is turned by a small little governor this whole thing could turn our tongues are the same way they could change the whole course of our life by our tongue. The life and death are in the power of the tongue. Notice in verse 5, Even so the tongue is a little member, and it boasteth great things. Behold, how great the matter a little fire kindleth. You could say something small, and it could blow up and rage like a fire out of control. That little bit of gossip that you thought would be fun and entertaining can go and hurt someone badly. That little lie that you tell can be propagated and just get to the place where it can't be taken back. Verse number six, and the tongue is a fire, the world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on course, on fire, the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Notice that phrase, it defileth the whole body. This is that same principle that if I put poison through my lips, then my body has to deal with the poison. Whatever I put in my mouth, I have to deal with the consequences, and whatever I put out of my mouth has consequences. And if what comes out of my mouth is poison, it could poison everything. If fire comes out of my mouth, it could burn everything. The Bible is saying that this is the same fire of hell. It could cause death to those around you. Verse 7, For every kind of beast and birds and serpents and things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. Here it's saying that all kinds of creatures have been tamed. People have pet tarantulas. They have pet snakes. They have pet whatever else. Oh, but the tongue... The tongue no man can tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. You can't trust your own tongue. That's why you can't have an unbridled tongue. You have one moment where you're not thinking about what you're saying and you can poison someone. You can hurt someone. It has to be constantly under control. Verse number eight, but the tongue no man can tame and is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therefore, so because our tongue needs to be controlled, because it's full of deadly poison, therefore we bless God, even the Father, and therewith we curse we men and are made after the similitude of God. It's amazing. We attempt to say God is good and sing songs and then turn around and hurt people with our tongue. It doesn't match. But that's what ends up happening. Verse 10, out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Doth a fountain seem forth at the same place sweet and bitter water? Here it's just giving this idea of how powerful our tongue really is. It must be controlled. Again, all of us can go back and give an illustration of how we've hurt people with our tongues. Isn't it amazing that it's harder to think of illustrations where we gave people life because of our tongues? We should be the type of people that when we speak, people know wisdom is going to come out. We should not be the type of people that have excused the term diarrhea of the mouth, that it just keeps coming out, coming out. And if you want to find something good, you have to dig in the mess to find it. If you were to take a sample of your speech today, was your speech used to help people? Or was it used to hurt people? What a sampling of your speech this last week 
Was it used to help people? Or was it used to hurt people? If you were to do a running tally of how many people were hurt compared to how many people were helped by your tongue in the last week, what would the tally be? Would it be really close? Or would it be way to the one side? We want it to be way to the one side, but on the good side. But unfortunately, it's usually to the middle, to the other side. How have you used your tongue? Remember, just like we have to live with every consequence of things that we put in our mouth. We also have to live with the consequences of the things that come out of our mouth. There is power of life and death. They're found in the power of tongue, the tongue. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.